You do know when teachers hear students talk about other teachers' classes, we assume that that means that we're not giving you enough work. Because <laughs> you should be talking about my, my, no, I'm ju just kidding, I'm just kidding. Uh, I like to say, I like to I like to say that to scare people, you know, you know it's it's one of the few uh, moments of joy I have in my life anymore. Um, boy, that sounded sad. I didn't mean it to sound that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh. yeah, it, it's like this will be come a viral hit. Professor melts down on YouTube, you know. I just don't know what to do anymore. All right. Uh, at any rate, we're going to talk today about good design and, and, and we throw out the term a, a, a good a well designed website or that's a good website or that's a good web page um, and, and we throw it out and, and it's one of those things where everyone kind of knows what you mean alright but you know this being a class and all we want to do better than kind of knowing what people mean when they say that we want to take a, a step back and sort of analyze it and not look at it simply from uh, a, a qualitative standpoint of I like, I don't like, to if not putting something quantifiable, like we can't measure a web page and say it's good if it's a score of such and such or higher or something dumb like that, but at least we can be more specific than saying we like it, we don't like it. Um, in one respect, I would say that a well-designed web page is kind of like uh, an umpire in a baseball game or a referee in a football game or basketball game. Why do you think I would say that? All right. Interesting. That's not what I was getting at. They said that there's quick decisions and judgment. When do you notice a referee or umpire in a baseball game? When they make a mistake. Right. So, in one respect, a lot of these design things are, are in a way, transparent to the user. In other words, the, you, you know, the, the typical user, someone that isn't a web development student and someone who isn't really well attuned to it, most of the time won't say, wow, that's a very good web design, uh, you know, very good, very well designed website. Oh, these are great pages and so on. They're just going to be on that site doing what they need to do and getting their job done. All right. When you notice a website is poor, it, uh, the design of a website typically is you notice if it's bad. In other words, gee, I can't find what time the uh, bus from you know Elyria to New York City runs. Um, I can't find out you know who the Browns play this weekend or things along those lines. When you can't get the answers that you need, that's when you typically notice the design of a website and, and notice that there's issues. So, in a way that's transparent to the user, but again, um, we as, as web developers and web designers have to pay attention to it because these things don't happen by accident. You don't get a well-designed page to be uh, uh, done or a well-designed site by accident. All right. I think it was Michael Jordan, if not We'll give them credit for it, all right? That said something to the effect of it takes a lot of work to seem this effortless, all right? Uh, which means that good web design might not seem like a big deal, you know? Just like an umpire might not seem like a big deal until it's not gotten right, until there's mistakes. And it might seem like, well, yeah, that's of course that's the logical way to organize the site and, and so on. It may seem like well, that should be self-apparent. Believe me, it's not. It's not self-apparent how it's designed. So if you see a well-designed website, I can virtually guarantee a lot of thought, a lot of effort was put into making it that way. And so we want to understand what some of the ideas that go into a well-designed website go into. Now, I take a little bit different approach to web design than you might see uh, a lot of people take or... Um, you know, a lot of people take, or a lot of people have, um, let's say, the 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 notion uh, of web design. Because again, the way that the page looks is only one aspect of the web design. All right, there's other, probably more important 
aspects of, of the web design. And we're going to talk about that. Let's start out first. Ultimately, I want to talk about some design principles for websites. Let's start off looking at design principles for individual pages. All right. Then we'll try to grow that into sites. And then we'll try to examine the process that we can go to to get to that. All right, so it's going to be sort of three steps. And this will likely extend into um, Thursday's discussion. All right, that, uh, and, and in addition to extending to the process, it will talk about your project in this class. All right, so first we're going to talk about what's a good web page. Then we're going to extend that to say what's a good website. And then we're going to say, what is uh, a process that we can use to get to that place. We know that that's our ending goal. How do we get there? So if you could describe what makes up a good web page, what would you say? What makes up a good web page? Oops. Or what are characteristics of a good web page? That's probably a better way to put it than what makes up a good web page. Simple. Okay, simple. When you say easily navigatable, are you speaking in terms of a page or are you talking about between pages? I don't want to have to read a dissertation to figure out how to get to what I want to get. So it's your example, right? Like, I want to be able to go in and see that the bus is running on time. I don't want to have to navigate through a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. All right. Um, I can definitely see that getting into the discussion of sites. So let's put that on the site page. All right. Because that really seems to be more an aspect of the site. What can we say along that line? If the, the, the statement was made to be able to navigate easily between pages. And that's more of an aspect of, of qualities of a good website as opposed to qualities of a good web page. How can an individual page help in that? I, I, I don't know. I, 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 yeah. Uh, individual web pages can contribute to that goal of being able uh, to, to navigate in being organized correctly. All right. In addition to being organized correctly, have a clear purpose for each page. So that you look at a page, you know what it means. What is your thought? What were you thinking when you said the word organized? What does, what does a well-organized web page mean to you? Repeat that, please. All right. So content grouped logically? Is that? That's fair. All right. What were you going to say on that? It's something you talked about last week, making sure that um, important details are right available. Email, content information. Okay. Uh, making sure that. Um, I'll say it this way, a sense of importance is conveyed. All right. Anything else that, that gets to the thought of a, a page being well organized? No, no. Yeah, it looks nice. Now, it's funny because a lot of times designers and people will say, you know, um, that, well, you know, it's not how it looks. It's, it's how it works and how it functions. That's true, but, all right, 
Uh, there's a great book that, and I don't, I'm not sure um, if, if I talked about it in this class or not. I kind of blur when I go between different classes because I bring up some of these side points, um, um, you know, in a bunch of my classes. But there's a point by uh, Don Norman, who is a famous designer of, of things, called Emotional Design. And what he talks about in that book is that his, his thesis is something like, Attractive things work better. And you might look and say, what? You know, the, how superficial is that? You know, you, in other words, you know, if I have two cell phones, if I have two phones, the one that looks better is going to work better. We all know cases where that isn't true. His thought process is something like this, and here's how it applies to, to web pages. It's something along the lines of, if you develop some sort of emotional reaction to a piece of equipment, a piece of hardware, a device, um, whatever it may be, you know, you tend to be more patient with it, right? It's funny, but, you know, you think about that with people all the time, right? If there's someone you like, you tend to be more patient with them. You tend to be more forgiving of them. You tend to be willing to go the extra mile more for them, as opposed to someone that you feel neutral about, or even worse, someone that you don't like, right? Norman's point is that people treat objects in a similar way. If there's an object that for whatever reason, you know, I hesitate the word have an emotional attachment to, you know, because, you know, it's not like I'm in love with my phone, but I do like my phone, all right? Because I like my phone, I tend to be more forgiving if my phone shuts down, for example. I have, a, I have an Android, uh, a, what is it, a Droid X2. And every once in a while, it just, it reboots itself. It says, I've had enough, I'm done, and boom, it starts up. Batteries fully charged and all that. But you know what? It's like, oh well, it's doing it again, ha ha ha. If it was a phone that I didn't like, every time it did it, it would annoy me and it would annoy me even more. All right, so how does this relate to websites? Almost the same way. If the website creates a favorable, positive, emotional impression, a lot of good things happen. All right? Number one, the content tends to be more memorable. All right? I had an, uh, an Ed Site class where they asked us to think of our most vivid memories of our childhood. And they said, almost every person, if you ask them to do that, will think of a memory that is very highly emotionally charged. You know, your most vivid memory isn't going to be, oh yeah, there was that day that I had breakfast and watched the Bugs Bunny cartoon, right? <laughs> Unless there happens to be something special about that, that you did it with your parents or you did it with your brother and sister and you really had a good time and so on. So it tends to be the things that are given an emotional charge, you know, tend to stick with us. Um, there's a commercial that everyone is talking about with the Super Bowl, and I didn't see it, so I don't know, but uh, the, the, the Chrysler uh, Jeep one, is that the one with the American farmer that they talked about? Yeah. It's like, what does that really have to do with buying? Nothing. But it, 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 it forges an emotional connection. So things that you can do to forge an emotional connection and to make your site likable is something that's going to work to your favor. People will be a little more patient in working with it. People will be a little more forgiving for it. And it's apt to make your content more memorable. So, making it look nice does have um, real practical benefits beyond just like, well, let's make it look nice so that it looks nice. You know, There really are tangible uh, benefits for that. In fact, there's an article here in Angel, and I encourage you periodically, as we're studying different stuff, as we're talking about different things, to go through the uh, resources on Angel. Because I have some like extra readings and stuff that really, I think, complement some of the course material. Wow, that was loud. Yeah, really. Let me turn that down. All 
All right, there we go. Now we don't have to see pop-up windows rattle the window, or pop-up screens rattle the windows. All right, so if we go here in our CISS 216 and we look under resources, again, there's a number of different things. There's an article from Wired uh, of, this is several years old now, but here's the interesting thing. Researchers have found that internet users give websites a thumb up or thumbs down in less than a blink of an eye. In a brief one twentieth of a second, less than half the time it takes a blink, people make aesthetic judgments that influence the rest of their experience with an internet site. All right? That's even more extreme than, than I would even think, you know, but, you know, apparently the research indicates that. One thing about the design of a page, in addition to being pretty, there's a functional aspect of it as well. Um, and we've touched on this a little bit as we talked about CSS, and we'll continue to, 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 to go over this when we talk about, um, you know, CSS layout and all that, is that in addition to looking nice, helping the user, being organized where things are grouped correctly and all that. Users make a, how do I want to say this? Users very quickly upon seeing your page either get the sense of your organization or don't. All right, get the sense of the page's organization or not. You know, if you go to a web page and it's just a jumble. Some of you folks have turned in some great bad web pages for the one lab assignment. And a lot of them, when you look at, it's like you have no idea where to look at first. Whereas most of your good web pages, the design of it is such that instantly you know how everything is laid out. All right? Part of that goes with one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to buck convention too much. Right? In other words, there are some standard things the way websites are done. Typically, navigation's either on the top or on the side or both. All right? If you put your navigation on the bottom, you're going to confuse some people. Or if you put it smack dab in the middle of the page, you're going to confuse people. Typically, the search box is usually, if you have a search on your site, is usually up here. You could put it somewhere else, but people are going to be looking for it there. So therefore, you know, by following uh, sort of standardized practices, that's another thing you can do. And in addition to the design things that you do to help organize the page, effectively, again, what you're doing is you're teaching the user the way your website works. All right? I've seen an occasional website that has, like, a help for how to do this. And it's like, you know, if there's ever a help link on a website, they probably failed in the design because the whole idea of the design is to set it up such that you don't need, you know, you just know how it works. You don't know how, but again, through the proper use of design and all these different elements, um, you learn how to use, uh, uh, how to use the site. What are some other aspects of a well-designed web page? Here's the ones we talked about now. Simple clear purpose and all that. Simple, I want to explore some of the thoughts that we had with that. One thing we said is we didn't want to read a dissertation. All right. Simple means a lot of things to a lot of people. All right. Einstein had a quote, I think it was Einstein, that says something to the effect that things should be made as simple as they need to be, but no simpler. Or as simple as they can be, but no simpler. All right? There's some things you simply can't simplify. All right? The nice thing about the web is, though, is with the hyperlinks and the hypertext, you can sort of prevent, uh, present uh, information on a variety of levels. All right? What do I mean by that? Well, if you're writing an article about a current event, 
you might put links to people that want more information about that event. All right. Let's say you know the Oscars were this past weekend, uh, and I unfortunately watched some of them. All right. Um, let's say I wanted to, uh, you know, let's say I, I was just interested in like who won the Oscars. You know, you could have an article on a page that covered that. The nice thing about the web, though, is you could also do things like have asides, right? Have sidebars with additional information. Have links that would link to related topics. And you can sort of balance the need that people have between some people wanting just the basic facts and other people wanting a more in-depth view. All right? So simplicity and complexity sort of complement each other, right? Yes, we want things to be simple, but Sometimes we want to know a lot of details about something if it's something we're particularly interested in. All right? And therefore, there's a balance between how simple you make it. How much content do you put on the page? You know? Yeah, we want to make it simple, but we don't want to put just a few words on each page where you'd have to go to 20 pages to get any kind of uh, you know, complete story for it. So the balancing act between Making it too simple and too complex is definitely uh, one that you have. Um, another aspect of simple relates to graphically. Not having extra extraneous graphics, stuff that's not needed, stuff that doesn't add to the presentation. That's bad from a couple perspectives. One is it, it, it takes up bandwidth, so that makes the page longer to download. The other problem is it distracts or has the potential to distract people from the stuff that is important. And lastly, it can kind of create an overall clutter on the page. All right. Remember back to the 120th second, the blink of an eye. And remember back uh, uh, that uh, a good website, for a good website, the organization is intuitive. All right? You're not going to get that if you have too much stuff on your page. Right? You're not going to get that if you have too much stuff on your page. If you have just the right amount of stuff on the page, all right, then you can make sure that it's organized in a clear and logical fashion and people can see where the navigation links are and can see where uh, different sections of the page are and, and, and intuitively understand uh, without needing an explanation of how the, how the site is structured. Anything else that we want to add to this list of characteristics of a good web page? Repeat that, please. Do you want to say something like a hook or something that draws you in? Interest? I'll say it this way, compelling content, all right? There's a phrase, and, and we can, you know, there, there's a great phrase that content is king, all right? So we can say that content is king or content is queen. doesn't matter how good your design is, the content is why people are going to visit your website, all right? Um, People aren't going to your website to see how well you've designed it. Oh, wow, that's a great looking website. Wow, I really like this. Let me go to another website. Wow, that, no. People are looking for specific pieces of content. So having compelling content is important. Now the reason that, that I, I didn't say a hook, I, uh, the student said to have a hook to, gr to grab interest, is that smacks to me of like, uh, really marketing slash advertising speak. And maybe you didn't intend it that way, but I just sort of have that connotation. What constitutes compelling content is going to be different depending on the kind of information that you're, you're trying to portray. All right? Um, if you are selling a new brand of soft drinks, you might want a very advertising looking hook to bring people in and to seem interesting and to seem fun and all that. If you're a lawyer that's advertising their service, their services, 
you don't want to take that approach and market yourself like you're marketing a soft drink, right? You want to market yourself, you want to provide compelling content. Well, what's compelling content in that context? Well, maybe a list of articles that, that the person has published might be, uh, might be good uh, for that. So that's not really a marketing kind of hook, but it is a way to demonstrate the expertise and, and credibility. So again, that's why I like the phrase compelling content. All right. What makes for compelling content? What about a, what about a, what about a website's content makes it compelling? Relevance. All right, relevance. Relevant to what? All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so w l let's take these one at a time. Relevance. Relevance for what you are searching for. And I'm going to use a word that I'll be using a million times, and you can actually count it and see if I'm lying. User goals. Relevant to the user goals. That's one. All right. Now, how do you judge that? Well, that's going to be part of our design process. How do you know what's going to be compelling to a user? Can you read people's minds? Well, no, you can't. But you can go through a process that hopefully will identify that. Another thing about compelling content is that it is, is fresh, new, updated. You know. What's it like to go to a website for an organization and you see the latest update was, you know, January 2011? It's like, well, they don't have anything to say to me, right? You know, and therefore you're likely to ignore it. You're likely to ignore it, oddly enough, even if the kind of information you're looking on really doesn't have anything to do with date and time, right? It just sort of gives you the idea that, well, this is kind of out of date and this isn't going to be particularly interesting. They really don't. They really didn't make their website a priority, all right? Therefore, it's probably not going to be very compelling. So that kind of sends a signal, too. So having things updated and new goes a long way, in my mind, to make it compelling, you know? Um, could you imagine, for example, um, you know, uh, you know, and again, we're, we're going back a little bit, but, you know, um, Pick any big news event, you know. Can you imagine, for example, an article about the political landscape that was written before the last election? You know, it's like, that ain't relevant, right? You know, they didn't know who was going to win the presidency or who was going to win the congressional seats and so on. So keeping things up to date, yeah, is important. It's important in making it compelling and it's important in giving the uh, veneer of appearing to be compelling and relevant and so on. All right. What's something else that would make uh, uh, information compelling? I don't know what I'm looking for. I want to know what makes content compelling. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the organization and how it looks that can lend to make it more compelling. Um, even on a very um, obvious level, on a very crude level, if it's not legible, it's not going to be compelling, right? So if you're not using adequate contrast between the colors, you can't read it. If you can't read it, it can't be compelling. So making sure it's legible. And and so on. Anything else? It, oh, okay. it, it seems like by discussing you know, compelling content, you need to know something about the user. You need to make some sort of assumption about the user. They're there for a purpose. Absolutely. What, what, why are they there? Uh, Did I fall into that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because we need to know what the user's goals are to know if it's compelling. That's two. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> 
Because, for example, even take something, let's assume that there's a topic that, that um, various people could be interested in. All right, let's, let's pick a topic that I'm interested in, jazz music. All right, I've listened to it for a long time, so I already know something about it. Now, I'm not a musician, though, so I don't necessarily know a lot about the technical aspects of the music. All right. Compare that with a student at the Oberlin Conservatory that is studying jazz. Compare that to a student in a jazz appreciation class. All right. They're all three, quote, interested in the same topic, right? But clearly, not all the material is going to be compelling to them. You know, an article that talks about, you know, the basics and the history and all that probably won't be compelling to me because I already know it and probably won't be compelling to the uh, musician because they either don't know it or they're not particularly focused on that aspect of it. But it might be interested in the sort of the general person in a, in a music appreciation class. Something about the technical, the harmonies that are used and the rhythms and all that, I don't really care about it. I probably wouldn't understand it. Neither would the casual reader, but the music student might, a and so on and so forth, you know. Um, new releases might be something I'd be really interested in, I'd be, find compelling, because, yeah, I, I want to know, you know, what's coming out new that I might like. Whereas someone that's a brand new novice, they, they don't even know what they like, they don't even know what to look for yet. So, again, so you're absolutely right. You need to know something about the users in order to consider the relevance in creating compelling content. So is this a discussion about sort of a shotgun versus rifle approach in what, what you're displaying or what you're conveying, or is that, can you have both, I guess? Uh, the, the question is, is can you have both? Uh, uh, by both, what do you mean? Um, so you just shot off some, you just shot off some examples regarding jazz. Right. Right. Jazz is broad. Right. Um, I guess the shotgun approach would be a number of links within the site covering multiple aspects of jazz versus a rifle approach, which would be just sort of jazz history or jazz. Okay. The, okay. The question that the student made is, is we could take a couple approaches getting back to our, our discussion of a website about jazz. We could try to satisfy everyone's goals a little bit, all right? Or we could try to focus on one area and really satisfy those goals. So, for example, maybe we make a website for the novice listener. Maybe we make a website for the connoisseur. Maybe we make the website for the musician, the student musician that's studying it. Or do we try to appeal to all of them, all right? Well, that's a great question. Are there any other great questions? <laughs> that's a great question. Well, you, you know, largely what it comes down to is this. There's another party that has goals here, right? That is the party that is making the website, all right? In other words, jazz websites or any websites don't pop up out of the blue, right? Someone makes them. Well, why are they making them? They could be making them for all kinds of reasons, right? I may be making it because I love jazz music and I want to share my love and my interest and my knowledge with the world. Now you might say, is that going to happen? It absolutely happens. Go on the web and look for fan sites about Doctor Who or, you know, any topic you can think of. Go to Wikipedia. You know, how much do people get paid to make those Wikipedia entries? You know, nothing. People that are passionate about things will go to crazy extremes <laughs> in expressing it and trying to win converts and in keeping people informed. So maybe that is who's making the website. And maybe my goal is to share my knowledge with the world and, and, and to share my passion with the world so that people become more interested in it. Another group of people that might be making a site about jazz might be a record company all right, that's trying to pitch their goods. All right. 
A third group could be a musical instrument company that is trying to sell their music and so on, their product. Uh, so to answer your question, which approach do you take, what you have is you hope to have an intersection between, I'll say, the organization goals and the user goals. And that intersection, you know, is what makes a successful website possible, All right? So if my audience doesn't care anything about my goals as a creator of the website, then that website isn't going to be very, very successful or it needs to be targeted to a different group of people. If me, or, or if me creating the site, what my goals aren't of, or the other way around, if the user's goals aren't of interest to me, then they're not really my users, right? Therefore, there needs to be an overlap. So, to answer your question, the approach that you take will be largely due to the nature of the perceived intersection between your goals and the goals of the users. So going back to our broad example of a jazz website, if I was a musical instrument company making a site about jazz, I probably would focus towards the musicians because they're going to be the ones buying the instruments, not the novices and not the casual listeners. So that would gear towards me. If instead I was, say, a, a university, doing that, you know, doing a website. As a university, I might have all kinds of people. I might have people that never heard jazz before in a music appreciation class. I might have people that were veteran listeners, and I may even have music students. In that case, I may go for the shotgun approach. So in other words, the, the, the relationship between my goals as the maker of the site and the user's goals will help me determine, am I going to drill down into one area or am I going to try to make everyone happy and, and try to address, address all of them? I mean, it is, you know, it is a balancing act to do that and to figuring out exactly how you want to go. It's possible that if you hook people in, all right, you may get them interested in things that they didn't think they were interested in in the first place. All right, so there's always that kind of thing, you know. So the goals don't have to line up exactly, all right, but there needs to be at least enough of a common ground to have that discussion. Now, you might say to yourself, you might, <laughs> If I'm going to do anything, I'm going to err on the side of caution and put all kinds of stuff on my website, even if I'm not sure if the user needs it or not. All right? That way, in case I'm wrong and the user does really want it or need it, it'll be there. That's one approach that you could take. What's wrong with that approach? Or what would be an argument against that approach? It's clutter. Absolutely. You want to try to focus in on the most important stuff and any extra stuff that you put in, you know, you might think to yourself, well, there's no harm in adding that. There is harm in adding that. And the harm is then that's one more place that they could click wrong when they're looking for something else, right? And that's one more thing that's taking up space on the screen that is going to muddy the waters for them and so on. So therefore, yeah, you, you try to want to stay focused. All right. You can have more than one goal and you can appeal to one more audience, but it is going to be very difficult to be all things to all people. All right. Um, one thing, one definition I've heard of for good software, and I think it even relates to web pages as well, even though it's not 
the software in the same sense that other applications are software like Word or whatever. But the statement was, as good software makes the common tasks easy, all right, and makes the uncommon tasks possible. Okay? So let's think about that. Someone visiting a college's website, what are the common tasks? Well, registering for classes, you know, looking up what's going to be offered next semester, finding the phone number of the professor so you can call them, um, seeing what events are going to be on campus this weekend. You know, we could list a list of all these common things, all right, that should be real easy to do. Now we could think of something that maybe is less common. Maybe someone is coming from the military, all right, and they have so many years experience in the military doing a particular task. Let's say working with computers, since that's my field. Can they get credit for any of that experience? Hmm. That's not common, right? Not necessarily everyone's going to be interested in that, you know. Only a small group of people maybe fit in that category. So it's an uncommon thing. It's certainly not as common as finding out what courses are going to be offered next semester. That's what every student does, right? But still, it's an uncommon test that should be at least possible. So there should be some guidance of what a person like that does. Now the interesting thing here is the website doesn't have to provide the answer, but the website simply needs to let the person know how you could contact, for example, the dean of the business division or computer faculty or whatever if you have one of these kinds of questions. All right. So again, it's not going to necessarily make, give easy solutions to everything. That's not possible. But it should provide easy solutions for the common things and at least provide a path, at least provide some possibilities for people that come in with sort of uncommon questions or uncommon issues. All right. What, what about now if we extend and we start talking about a website as opposed to individual web pages? We talked about the web pages being simple, not cluttered, having the right amount of content, giving people the ability to get more content if they want to, but not requiring that you read a dissertation to know who won uh, the Best Actor Award uh, in the Oscars. We talked about all those kinds of things. What about when we talk about a website? Yes? We talked about it last week where when you move from one page to the other, you're certain you're still on the same page. Okay. So navigation, we talked about that before, but sort of a consistency. And we can point to consistency a, a bunch of different ways, right? Consistency in terms of the way it looks. So, you know, a consistent color scheme, uh, consistent font choices. Consistency in the layout. There's a heading on the page, there should be a heading on every page, right? Consistency in terms of navigation. Navigation isn't on the top in one place and on the left in another page, all right? So consistency is important. We could also talk a little more subtle, you know, consistency in terms of uh, the tone that the site takes, right? In other words, if it's a serious site, be serious throughout. You know, if it is a fun site, be fun throughout. That's one thing I guess we could put, and it's kind of arbitrary to break this down to talk about pages versus sites because no one puts up a single web page, right? But the appearance match the tone of the site. Again, a serious site should look serious. Uh, fun site should look fun. We also said something like, like things should look alike. So, if we had product reviews about our products on a web page, they should all be styled in a similar way. 
so that a user at a glance knows once they've seen one product review, they see something else that looks like it's like, oh, that must be another product review. Who has completed the lab concerning good and bad websites? All right. Um, except what? Uh oh. Yeah. Okay. I'm actually going to. Well, how about this? Let me ask this question. Can any of you name an example of a well designed or poorly designed website? Parks. Cleveland Metro Parks. And what is, let me Google them. Now, okay, don't say if it's good or bad. Okay. Is, this the, is this the correct site? Oh, well, I guess we have to wait till it shows up. One thing about the slowness of a site is it's tough initially to blame that on the website. You need to you need to take you need to take a test at a few different times, right? It could be this computer that's just a dog. Could be the something goofy going on with our network here at L C and all that. So can't really judge it on, on one instance. But yeah, that did seem a little long to load. All right. But again I'm not necessarily going to blame it on that until I have more evidence. What do we think about this? Well it's engaging. I mean you got different pictures and mm -hmm. it'd be timely and cold weather. Okay. Pardon me? It's a clean design. All right. It's a clean design. Now, um, what are some of the guidelines that we talked about? We talked about um, the content matching the tone of the site. Or, I'm sorry, the, the appearance matching the tone of the site. Do we think this one does it? Yeah. This sure, look, sure looks like an outdoorsy site, right? It's meant to be outdoors for the parks and all that. And it sure gives me that, you know. If you were to, you know, change the words to another language, I'll bet I could guess that this is for parks or at least some sort of outdoor uh, facility. All right. Um, do we think it looks good? Yeah. yeah, looks good. Is it clear where we would go to if we wanted to do something? If you got six big options. Yeah, seems pretty clear. What's something you might want to know about a metro park? Yeah, what's going on there? Oh, look, there's an event calendar. All right. What's another thing you might want to know? Where can I ski? All right. Oh, look, activities, what to do and where to do it. All right. Another answer, where is Edgewater Park or whatever? Find a place. So I would say this does a pretty good job with relevant content. All right. So I'm guessing you consider this a good site. Is that correct? I think it's brand new. Yeah, yeah. And I would say this, yeah, this looks like a, a pretty pretty good site. Again, just judging on the home page, we should probably look around at some other things. Let's check the fish and report. Here's one thing to keep in mind about this. When I say a site needs to be consistent, all right, that doesn't mean that every page has to look identical. All right. In fact, often what you will have is there's, there's a couple variations on that theme. One big variation is that the home page is going to look different than sort of the internal pages, right? Because the home page is, you know, meant to grab your attention, all right? Uh, Jacob Nielsen, a uh, famous web designer in I think one of the articles that are posted in the resource section, says something to the effect of uh, a company's home page is the most expensive real estate in the world because they spend thousands of dollars designing it and doing it for something that's going to fit on a one square foot screen or maybe a little bigger. 
All right. So the home pages have to look different than that. In addition, a site, especially a big site like this, is likely to have sections where there's going to be individual variances. For example, here we're in, I forgot what we clicked on, activities I think. <coughs> Notice that this stays constant from all the pages that we're in, but this is going to be, I would expect, different if we go to different sections. For example, if I go to um, find a place. All right. That sub-navigation on the side is different. It now shows me a list of parks instead of a list of activities. If I go to register and reserve, it shows me things that are relevant for this section. So that's another thing where it can be different. I mean, the navigation doesn't have to be identical on each page. You can have your site broken into sections. But do notice, number one, <coughs> this stays consistent, and this stays consistent on every page. These are the things that were highlighted in those big things that look like wooden boards. And here's a nice thing, again, subtle, like a referee in a baseball game. Notice those again, those look like little boards, like something cutesy you might see in a park. Yeah, all right, that's neat, you know. Let's go to activities now. Okay, that was annoying that it didn't take me to the activities page, but no one's perfect. All right. Here's the point I was going to make. Again, subtle, like a umpire. Same background, even though it looks different, right? It's not the individual boards. It's just a bunch of them sort of jammed to the side. It's still the same background of that. That gives you a visual cue that you might not even notice that says, these links are the same as these links. Which take 20 minutes to see. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 speed, the speed of the website loads, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the questions where there's so many factors that influence that that I'm not going to backseat program and, and say what's going, going wrong. Um, it could be any number of reasons that, it, that it's slow. Even assuming, you know, assuming that there's no problems at our end, because you said at your house it's yeah, the same thing, there still could be <coughs> any number of issues on their end that could be causing that. And that, that's one thing that, that's, that's tough in terms of troubleshooting. I mean, it could be that their web server, pardon me? It could be something and it could be something in between. Very true. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you, you can do that depending on, on the specific platform. Yeah, you can do something like that. Could be the images that are loading. A lot depends on how they load this. They, are, they might be preloading all those images and just doing a slideshow, which means that. But that wouldn't explain why I would do it the second time because I would think those would be cached then and it wouldn't need it. It's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Um, I love that because, I, you know, if I don't want to, I don't have to answer any questions because I can just say it's hard to say or it depends on a lot of factors or, or whatever. Students don't have that luxury on tests. They usually have to come up with a, a complete answer. On the whole, though, I would say this is a pretty good, pretty good site, pretty, pretty well designed. There, I thought there was a 
another point I was going to make, but I don't recall at this point. Probably not important. The, really, the only thing I'd be concerned about is is the load time. That was that was annoying. Uh, and and if it, if it continued to have that, now that doesn't mean that the page itself is bad. Again, could be that could be a, you know, could be all you know our issues. It could be the issues in between. It could be an issue on their end. Even if it's an issue on their end, it could be that their server just isn't up to handling the 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 load that it's that it's handling. Uh, you know, the load of requests. It could be that this actually is an ASP site. <coughs> so it could be that um, it wasn't coded efficiently on that level. They could be trying to send too many images. If this is interacting with a database, it could be um, a bottleneck in the database server. You know, dozens of different potential problems. Hmm? Yeah. Why would this have been coded ASP and not HTML? And am I even asking a relevant question? You are asking a very relevant question, and that's a good question. And we will touch on this towards the end of the semester. But I, I do think it's a good question to answer now, even. The difference between, I said this is an ASP site, and how do I know that? Because if I look at the file up here, there's an ASPX extension on the end, not, not an HTML. That means that it's written with ASP. Now what does that mean to say it's written with ASP? It means that a human, all right, didn't necessarily write the HTML that you're seeing here. The human wrote a program which writes the HTML that you see here. All right, that's kind of a simplification, all right, but it sort of is one level deeper, all right? In other words, you still need to know HTML, right? Because if I, if I am going to write a program to average 10 numbers, I better know how to average 10 numbers, right? Otherwise, I can't write a program to average 10 numbers. So you still need to know HTML, <coughs> but someone developed a series of programs, files, scripts, called any number of different things, that created this page. All right? And why would they do that? Well, we can see that right here when we look under the visit. All right? There's a list of, I don't know, 20 or so parks. Right? Now, presumably, they add parks periodically. You know, a new park opens here or there. It's not a rare occurrence. They may change something about that. So the idea is this, rather than writing web pages for 20 different parks, we're going to write a generic web page for a park. And we're then going to fill the details in with data from a database. All right. So is that getting into the area of dynamic pages versus... Yeah, dynamic pages, exactly. So like, for example, if we could click on this, visit Acacia Reservation. Uh, I'm going to make a liar out of me. Let's go to Amazon, because Amazon's a better one to show this for. How many products does Amazon sell? <laughs> yeah, right. You can't even answer that question. You can't even guess a number. You know, people say millions, you know. There are millions of cars in a parking lot. Well, usually when you say millions, you're exaggerating. It would not be exaggerating to say that. that. Let's go and search for something. Let's go search for Beatles records. All right, here's a bunch of Beatles records that we can look for. And we can look at one. All right. Notice the layout of it. Picture of the, the record cover. Title. Add to cart. bought together. Customers have bought this also bought that. Product details all the way down the line. Now let's go over and look at a different one.
Guess what? Layout's the same. All right? In other words, there's web, one page that has the template for this that's created. And through the use of dynamic programming techniques that access a database and pulls in stuff to fill in the blanks, then this web page gets created as opposed to some other web page. All right. Um, all right. Uh, we'll see you over in lab.
Wellington. What How did you, you do on your test? Your test? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you. <laughs> or don't tell us, that's alright too. I mean, you know, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs>